So this is a, a kind of a wide ranging issue. And I'm sorry, I didn't get my notes in great order, so I might be jumping back and forth. But uh, the goal here is just to open up a discussion on something that I think we haven't maybe spent enough time on. Uh, let me just start by saying, um, as the uh, 2018 elections approach, I think that um, possibly the biggest challenge we face is not one we always talk about. Um, it, the challenge I'm talking about is bigger even than the almost one quarter of 25% uh, of working class uh, people who are <coughs> Trump supporters. Somebody needs to mute your coughing. Okay. Um, a challenge that's even bigger than dealing with almost a quarter of the working class uh, people who are Trump supporters or Trump voters. We're talking. I'm talking about a group that includes twice as many members of our working class, and these are the folks who choose not to vote. And I don't want to in any way discount the effect of voter suppression of the voters who are barred outright by or you know kept from voting by voter ID schemes or uh, ch challenges at the polling place or closed polling places. I, voter suppression is definitely real. But I think uh, what I want to take a look at is what underlies that 50% non-participation. And I think that it's underlying a view toward collective action. Um, voting in our uh, society is viewed as an individual act. And if you look at it that way, it's true, no matter what anybody says, one vote hardly ever makes a difference. Uh, very few elections are won by one vote. But um, th that's the problem. The American working class doesn't see voting as a collective action. It doesn't see it as an effective way to um, influence people's lives. In fact, um, the common view of the whole political system is one which is irredeemably corrupt and that nothing uh, can be gained by participating. In fact, uh, people I've challenged, why aren't you voting? They, act like, um, you know, they feel like you're almost a sucker to vote, you know, you, you're getting tricked into doing something that's not going to have any effect because they nothing changes no matter what you do. Um, and uh, so leading to, uh, you know, some uh, narratives about the thing to do is throw out everybody who's in office, get in a whole new group of people or a variation of that is calling for term limits. Um, and uh, you know, this could sound kind of radical. I know we might react that way when we hear it, but um, but this cynical uh, narrative pervades our culture, and even um, we hear a f echo of that even on the left, where we hear people saying the same thing: throw out everyone. It's not worthwhile to participate because the two-party system is, you know, rigged, and you can't get anything done. And even labeling, you know, progressive or middle or non right wing politicians as neoliberals or class collaborationists, um, you know, is a, a, a faint echo of throwing cold water on the whole um, idea of the value of participating in this collective action. So whether it comes from the left or the right, the view that this collective action cannot be effective um, is a tremendous um, challenge to our working class. And I don't think we've attached enough importance to that. Um, the capitalist view of voting is that it's a, the expression of one's uh, sort of a personal statement by somebody. It's a way to you know, make, make your own personal statement. And sometimes even online discussions um, kind of take place under this kind of logic. This uh, belief is, uh, uh, that that collect so this is only uh, and I this whole discussion is not supposed to just be about voting but I've used it as the a prime example of um, how a certain individualist uh, ideology infects uh, you know our our political thinking um, and this belief that uh, collective action is ineffective is fostered in a thousand ways you know our country particularly, we have the glorification of rugged individualism, the idea, you know, the magic of the market is, um, you know, what makes things happen, what's uh, responsible for progress. 
the idea that anything done in a group encourages people to be lazy and kills initiative, the idea that humans are inherently corrupt. Um, and uh, these ideas are not just accidentally found. They're carefully crafted in right-wing think tanks that come up with these kind of narratives. The best, I don't have time to go into all of them, but a good example is this um, think tank that produces a website called Union Facts. Um, and what they do is explode stories, any iota of corruption in a union that they can find that use the term union boss to give people the idea that um, it doesn't do any good to form a union, to work together collectively, because inevitably it's going to be uh, corrupt and um, you're going to get screwed. So you might as well strike out on your own. Um, another example, um, I think, is it, it can't just be accidental, a consistent effort to describe the fight for equality, the fight against racism, uh, against male supremacy, to always describe it in individual terms um, as, you know, an individual uh, challenge rather than as a collective project of a group of workers. Um, so uh, the fight for equality as the fight for workers' rights is posed as an assault on individual freedoms. Um, and we are treated to many stories of the uh, uh, failure of collective action, whether it's what I just mentioned of the unions or that um, uh, social security is going bankrupt um, or that, uh, you know, trying to undermine Obamacare, you know, the most <laughs> mildest form of uh, group health care. Um, and at the same time, and also to point to um, challenges that socialist oriented countries have had as proof that people can't succeed by working together collectively. Um, at the same time, successful collective efforts get short shrift, whether it's, you know, the success of Medicare or um, the uh, success of strikes. And, you know, we just met with some hotel workers today and our, came by our office and it's, it was just so awe-inspiring, the story of how these uh, 26 hotels organized and they're in groups of 10 and each has their own leader and the groups take care of each other and have raised money to help each other who, one person got their utilities shut off. They all pitched. Anyway, all the things and how they run their own picket lines. And, and they're on the cusp of a really big uh, victory against these multi-million dollar operations. These are people who make beds and, you know, clean for a living. And people were kind of amazed in a good way to know that they make $20, $22 an hour and have health care and so on. This is a success of their collective efforts. We rarely um, hear about that. So another um, uh, item from the current news I wanted to bring up um, relating to this idea about um, how the working class views uh, collective action is the right to work issue and, um, and how they're uh, posed, how it's presented, even within our own movement and even within the labor movement. As we know, um, the right to work laws effectively outlaw collaboration by workers. Um, they make it illegal. Um, it's not enough to require that the majority of workers have to sign cards and vote in their workplace. But even after they do all that, right to work laws make it illegal for them to form an effective organization. It doesn't allow them to make their own rules in the place that, you know, where they're the majority and they do all the activities, they're not allowed to cooperate. But I think many well-meaning people in the labor movement and outside argue against right to work in, on the basis of uh, attacking freeloaders. You know, it's, just, if that, it's kind of a, another um, individual liberty kind of an argument. And I think that um, using that kind of an argument falls into the trap of um, undermining the importance of collective action. So um, uh, given this, I think uh, the special role that the idea of individual rights plays in our culture, um, 
led us to introduce the idea of uh, Bill of Rights Socialism. And I, you know, re repeating what some of those things are was free speech, freedom of the press, religion, and even privacy. Um, so um, I think that, you know, we should do some more discussion and, you know, take this idea a little further because uh, instead of seeing that these are sort of individual rights posed against a uh, collective um, the right to take collective action, to, to look at some dynamic between the exercise of these rights and strengthening the collective action, because, um, you know, we've talked maybe about having to build into to the infrastructure of socialism or, of, you know, social struggles and organizations, um, things that ensure that broader speech and democracy. And I think that we can make a contribution to the struggle by thinking about how these um, interrelates. Uh, some of the weaknesses of collection, collective action in working class history maybe could be attributed to a lack of us having a structure that actually allows more democratic input. So um, it, it, allowance of what's been called individual rights is actually part of strengthening collective rights. Um, Okay, so how's my time, Joelle? Minutes. Okay, one minute? Four okay, I, minutes. Four minutes, okay, that's a little better. All right, um, so uh, another um, example um, you, just in the news today, the uh, announcement that the Amazon workers will be receiving or will be getting a $15 an hour pay. There's different ways to give credit for that. Either the goodness of uh, Jeff Bezos um, would be one, uh, one way to attribute that uh, success. But um, I think that uh, the enormous um, collective action on so many fronts by the the labor movement, but individual workers and political action and um, so many different kinds of the religious community um, has really uh, achieved that, but it's not portrayed. And I think it's important um, for us to to uh, show that another somebody else gave credit to Bernie Sanders because he had raised the issue. And I think he certainly should be credited with with raising the issue. But again, it's not one person who did it, I think the workers and the, uh, and the leaders of the movement get the credit. Um, so uh, just to kind of bring this to a close, uh, what's the role of uh, communists? <laughs> um, I think um, the fundamental ideological challenge in the United States is our, a lack of class consciousness and that so what is class consciousness? Because almost every ideological issue comes back to that. Um, we are an organization of the working class and class consciousness means to change uh, to seeing as uh, for seeing as an individual to seeing things as a class and understanding our position in society and in the economy, our position as a class and understanding how we can be effective only as a class. Um, and uh, that we have so many uh, great examples that just mentioned. Oh, well, I meant to mention this enormous right to work victory in Missouri, which we really should study, included many uh, Trump voters and uh, the religious community where they um, uh, made a collective uh, victory and effort to guarantee because of their understanding of being uh, effective collectively in changing the situation in the workplace. There's got to be some important lessons there. Um, I think that the Me Too movement is also a case of collective action because all of us know for however many years it is that women have complained and, and filed complaints and made whatever and been not effective in changing the workplace uh, conditions. But when a collective action of women joining together and simultaneously um, taking this on in many fronts and working class women and support from other women um, has 
definitely changed the balance of power. Not that it solved everything, but uh, in the workplace. So um, I think um, we need to pay the, the, the things that communists say, even though we're small, we have a small circulation. When an idea rings true, then it's adopted and spread all over. And that's times a thousand in the age of social media. I think we have to pay attention to get our narratives right, to um, really think about this issue of the, to, to prove the effectiveness of collective action and to um, try to avoid the narratives that while they might serve a small point in the short run, undermine class consciousness in the long run. Um, and to take that just back uh, to workers, um, you know, when we think of uh, the 90% of our country, which is working class, and the um, amazing power it could have if people, um, if we saw that this is a collective, voting as a collective tool, um, not that it is going to cause socialism, but <laughs> that we can uh, see immediately, but that we can see that we can both change, um, you know, real conditions of, that people live and struggle under and also change the balance of forces. Um, and that it's not just a, something that, um, uh, not merely a tool of self-expression. So what do you think? <laughs>